An Armada map in Call of Duty Cold War involves the CIA and the Russians fighting over a large ship for control of a prototype submarine in the docks below. But did you know that this encounter is based on a real event called Project Azorian that occurred during the Cold War? Let's take a look into what really happened and then compare it to what we get in game. The event still remains highly classified to this day and is therefore still shrouded in much mystery, conjecture and conspiracy theories. But here's what we know. In April 1968, a Soviet fleet of ships, submarines and planes were spotted acting out of character and behaving strangely in the North Pacific. Their movements were at odds with their normal routes. It was as if they were looking for something. The US determined they were looking for one of their Gulf Class II nuclear submarines, the K-129. It had missed consecutive report ends on its way to its designated patrol station just off the coast of Hawaii. After weeks of searching, the Soviets called off the search. So yeah, they were seemingly happy to leave a nuclear sub with three ballistic missiles with nuclear capabilities at the bottom of the ocean. You'd actually be surprised how many are down there. The Americans, however, would not be put off so easily. Using their sound surveillance system in the North Pacific, which included an extensive hydrophone network, a vast collection of underwater microphones used to track submarines, they reviewed through the recordings and eventually they were able to detect an underwater event that occurred on March 8th, 1968. An implosion. Upon cross-checking with other hydrophones in the area, they were then able to narrow down the event to within a five nautical mile area. This area was hundreds of miles from where the original search area was. The Soviets had been looking in the wrong place. The Americans now had a good idea of where the submarine was. A few months later, in July 1968, Operation Sand Dollar began with the USS Halibut, leaving Pearl Harbor and heading to the search area. This was the US's very own nuclear spy submarine, and its goal was to locate and take images of the K-129 submarine. After three weeks of searching with robotic cameras, the US Halibut finally found and took over 20,000 images of the wreckage. It was from these images that the US believed the three nuclear ballistic missiles would still be intact, and they began preparing the largest salvage attempt in history. They were hoping to raise the wreckage to the surface and take it home with them. Clearly no easy task. The technology to do so did not exist yet. Additionally, not only was the wreckage out in the middle of nowhere and 5,000 metres below the surface, but it was also an act of piracy and broke international law to do so. If they were caught, they risked serious repercussions, heightened tensions with the international community and the likely escalation of the Cold War. However, despite these risks, the wealth of intelligence the K-129 offered the US was too good an opportunity for them to turn down. Potentially knowing more about the Soviet sonar systems, communication systems, their technology for moving silently through the water and their nuclear technology outweighed any cons. Therefore, sometime in 1970, President Nixon put together a secret task force and tasked the CIA with leading the recovery operation. Very few knew about the operation. They even kept it a secret from their own navy. Several outrageous ideas were put forward to recover the K-129. But in the end, they went with the idea of building a ship with a mechanical arm that could be lowered to the ocean floor, grab hold of the submarine, pick it up and lift it into a hidden area inside the ship's hull. So the entire operation could be done underwater, away from the view of any other ships, aircraft or spy satellites. Global Marine Development, a leader in deep sea drilling, were tasked by the CIA to design, build and operate a ship capable of bringing the submarine to the surface. This ship would become known as the Glomar Explorer. From the outside, it would look like any other drilling vessel, which was the idea, but it was anything but that. It was unique and was a purpose-built submarine salvage vessel. So now they had the technology to perform this incredible feat that had overcome any engineering obstacles, but to keep the ship's real intentions a secret to the outside world, particularly the Soviets and the newspapers, the CIA needed a plausible cover story for why this ship would be in the North Pacific and that is where Howard Hughes comes in. Howard Hughes was an eccentric American billionaire, investor, record-setting pilot, engineer, film director and philanthropist. He was approached by the CIA to help them keep the salvage operation a secret. He went public with a fabricated story that he'd been conducting marine research and mining undersea at extreme depths. Therefore, the ship then became known as a huge Glomar Explorer. Although he lent his name and company's resources to the operation, Hughes and his companies had no operational involvement in the recovery process. 
When the huge Glomar Explorer set sail to the location, the CIA had managed to largely keep the ship's intentions a secret. However, there were inclinations within the Kremlin and Russian intelligence of what their Americans' true purpose was. But due to the fact that they didn't know where the K-129 was themselves, and that raising a submarine seemed an impossible feat at the time, so they brushed aside the fears that this would occur. Regardless, when the huge Glomar Explorer was on location and were lowering the arm to the ocean floor, it was noticed and visited by the Soviets on two occasions. The first time was what appeared to be a civilian vessel and the exchange communication in Russian and moved on. On the second occasion a tugboat appeared and it was much of the same but the conversation was a bit more confrontational this time but once again they did end up moving on. It is believed the Soviets did continue to observe from a distance but if they suspected something operations clearly continued and the explorer continued to lower the claw to the wreckage on the sea floor. At some point the claw reached the wreckage, grabbed hold of it and began the slow process of bringing it back to the surface. However, part way up disaster struck. Several of the arms that made up the claw snapped off and as a result two thirds of the submarine fractured and fell back to the sea floor. A third remained within the claw. All three of the sub's ballistic missiles would be in the part that broke off. On the 8th of August 1974, they eventually raised a section of the K-129 into the Hall of the Explorer. Inside were two nuclear-tipped torpedoes, some code books, and the bodies of six Russian servicemen. Most of what they had hoped to examine remained at the bottom of the ocean. Before the Explorer returned to port, the sailors received a burial at sea with military honours. Due to fears of radioactive contamination, they were buried in metal coffins. The ceremony was recorded by the CIA and the footage was later passed to Russian officials in 1992 once the Cold War was over. So that's the story, but how much of this Black Ops event made it into and influenced the Armada map in Cold War? Let's compare the location, dates and name first. On the load up screen for Armada we are given some details about where Operation Armada takes place before it gets redacted. The real event all occurred in the North Pacific but our Amada map is set in the North Atlantic for some reason. When you check the coordinates shown for the map, they indicate a location in the centre of the Atlantic Ocean. So there are similarities in the location in that they are both thousands of miles from anywhere in the middle of an ocean, albeit different oceans. The naming of both are also different. However, there is some interesting information regarding the names of both operations. It is believed that Project Azorian got its name from the Azores, which is a group of islands in the North Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Portugal. Which is strange in considering the actual event was in the Pacific, but maybe that explains why the Armada map was set in the Atlantic in the game. However, choosing to call the map Operation Armada is also interesting, as this was the name given to a series of British sabotage operations during the Second World War. These missions were carried out against the canal transport system of German occupied France by agents of the Special Operations Executive to prevent the canal's use for the movement of e-boats and midget submarines. So the name Operation Armada is already linked to past operations involving submarines. So the developers could have potentially chosen the name for this association. We don't know. Regarding the date shown in the intro, the 7th of October 1984. This date does not correspond to the real event either. This is many years after the real event took place. I could not find out any Cold War activity related to this date. The only thing I did find slightly interesting was that this date was the birth date of the current president of Russia, Vladimir Putin. He was born on this date. So let's move on to the game setting. Looking at an overview of the Armada map, you can see you have the main ship that is likely to represent the huge Glomar Explorer. Either side of that you have a US and Soviet destroyer and then the rest are destroyed ships and boats indicating that a sea battle has taken place. From this we can ascertain that the parties involved are the same as the real event. The CIA and the Soviets are both there. However, there was no battle and no military vessels were involved. But of course this is a video game after all and they had to change this part. That is expected. However, one thing I will mention is even though there was no combat during the entire operation, the Russian ship highlighted here does strike a big resemblance to the Russian civilian ship Kazma that visited the site on multiple occasions and monitored from a distance during the operation. The ship in game, just like the Kazma, also has a helipad at the back, and on that helipad is a twin turbine helicopter. 
Just like the real event, there was a twin turbine helicopter that circled above the Gloomar Explorer, taking images and trying to see what they were doing. So maybe this is intentional and the developers realised what went on and put this in the game. Nice touch if they did. But what they changed within the game is it appears to be that the Soviets are trying to salvage their own submarine and the CIA are attacking them. So rules are somewhat reversed from the real event. In support of this is the mission briefing pre-round. It states, commandeer a Soviet salvage operation and secure their prototype nuclear submarine. The main vessel in game is also a Russian vessel and that is indicated with the Russian writing all over it. While the vessel does look somewhat similar to the Glomar Explorer, there certainly are differences also. Here is a side by side comparison of the two from the front, back and various other angles. The vessel in game does have lifts and cranes on deck in addition to large metal support beams but it is open either end which differs from the Glomar Explorer. That vessel was completely enclosed to ensure secrecy. Maybe that's a possible explanation for why rules are reversed in game. The Soviets tried to recover their submarine but as they weren't doing so in secrecy the Americans noticed and were able to try and steal it. Therefore we have a fight on our hands. The final comparison we are going to make is the submarine and the claw arm. In game the submarine is largely intact apart from the seal section which is showing some damage. We know from the real event that the K129 was in much worse condition but did the developers get the appearance of the K129 correct? Well no. The rear of the sub and how it is propelled is much different in game to what the K129 would have looked like. Additionally, when you look at the top side of the submarine it has 8 ballistic missile tubes. The K129 only had 3. The submarine stats at the beginning of the game were clearly not meant to be looked into as things are about to get a little bit silly here but we'll do them anyway. The weight given of 40,000 pounds which is 200 tonnes is nowhere near heavy enough for a submarine. That would be similar to the weight of a midget submarine. In real life the K129 in comparison was 550,000 pounds so 2,750 tonnes which is over 13 times heavier than that given for the submarine in game. The submarine we see in game has a length given as 80 foot, so just over 24 meters. Well that doesn't even correspond to what we see in game. It is clearly longer than that, at least 50 meters. The K129 was 100 meters in reality, but this would not have been plausible in game unless the map was going to actually be designed around the submarine and that the submarine was going to be playable inside and out. The main area is the vessel around it. So there is a sub there in game, just like there was in the real event, however it is vastly different in appearance as well as the stats compared to the real K129. The claw, or should I say the straps, we see in game holding the submarine in place are also clearly very different and as such I think we can now definitively say that the developers as a whole made this map very loosely based on the real events. Which of course was always going to be the case as the Cold War wasn't a full on military conflict between the US and the Soviets. And because of this the developers were always going to have to take certain liberties and basically mix stuff up. Regardless, I hope you still enjoyed this video and a bit of history. It took a seriously long time to make and if you want to see more on what the other Cold War maps are loosely based on, please let me know in the comment section below and also which map you would like to see next and I'll do a bit of research on it and see if it's plausible. Please also drop a like and sub if you haven't already. Many thanks for watching folks, stay safe out there and I'll catch you again in the next one.